I first told some of my story over on another channel. Later learned that the guy was a fraud. Also that he edited out a huge portion of my encounter. You see, back in the early 90s, me and my daughter had our dogman encounter. We were out fishing, and truthfully, it wasn't exactly terrifying at all. That day, we had been fishing for crappie in one of the lakes. Imagine this, the two of us on my flat boat, anchored right at the edge of these high weeds and reeds. The water's no more than seven feet deep, and we're using these old school crappie fishing poles. My daughter, who's actually better at catching fish than me, is burning them up, catching fish after fish after fish. I remember bending over to get some more bait out of the live well, and then hearing this explosion in the water. It sounded like something or someone quickly scurrying through that water away from us. We used our long fishing rod spreading and laying down those reeds. And that's when we get a glimpse of this wolf. And let me tell you, this thing had to be 11, 12 feet tall. And remember, we were in seven feet of water. Worst case scenario, the depth changed from seven to five feet from where we were to where we saw it. But nonetheless, this thing still had to be tall because its waist was above the water. Its head is turned to the left, looking off in another direction. And it's almost as if it was listening for some kind of sound. Now, I'm not sure if you ever found yourself in a situation like this, but what my daughter and I did was we froze for a brief second, looked at each other. She whispers to me, Dad, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? And I say, yes, honey. And I tell her, yes. So I tiptoe to the front of the boat, gently pulling the anchor from the water, then crank her up and get the hell out of there. Now, listen to me. That was our dog man encounter. But see, I talked about the things that happened after my dog man encounter and no one ever heard it so now i want to share it with you two weeks pass from that incident and we start to have this string of bad luck incomprehensible bad luck i go to pick up my daughter from school it's about 30 miles away from home i get to school successfully pick her up we get about eight blocks away from the campus and I get a flat tire. Listen, no problem. Hop up out of the car, change the tire. Listen, no problem at all. I hop out of the car, get the spare, put it on. Now we're back on the road. Then we get five miles away from our house and get another flat tire. Listen, we have to get a ride, have the car towed home, and not only buy a new tire, but buy a new spare tire never seen anything like that in my life then a few days after that weird and strange stuff starts happening around my house i'm in the kitchen my daughter is in the back of the house in her bedroom on the cell phone with a little punk boyfriend that i didn't like at that time i'm standing over the stove making chicken fried rice when i hear this growl in my house now initially i'm thinking okay she's got the tv on too loud but then she comes flying into the kitchen saying, Daddy, did you hear that? Did you hear that growl? But then she comes flying into the kitchen. Dad, Dad, did you hear that growl? What was that? Even her punk boyfriend on the phone heard this growl. And it was loud, man. Scared me so much that I went into the attic with a shotgun trying to see if we had some kind of wild animal in the attic of our condo. Now, pause. Let me explain this to you. To be clear. My daughter and I don't live anywhere near woods. We live in condos, essentially row houses attached to each other in the middle of the city. A couple of days later, it's time for her to go to school. We're sitting at the kitchen table eating breakfast when we hear the growl again, this time coming from my bedroom. Look, it scared my daughter so much. She hops up, grabs her bag, goes outside and sits in a car waiting for me to take her to school listen 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 if you think that's bad we're not done yet so that same morning on our way to school she says daddy i need to stop by walgreens and get some loose leaf paper for my class so she and i go into walgreens to get loose leaf paper and they come in and rob the place two dudes come in with masks on screaming get on the ground get on the ground now my daughter and i are huddled in the back of walgreens by the pharmacy department 
I'm thinking to myself, man, what the f have I done wrong? Listen, I didn't make the full connection between our Dogman encounter and the bad luck that happened afterwards until I heard another interview on this channel. And then all of the pieces to the puzzle came together. Because for days after those events, my daughter and I were on edge. And then the bad luck and all the strange occurrences stopped as they started, just as suddenly as they started. Now to this day, I'm not sure what to make of it. But what I can tell you is this, the only thing about our routine that changed, we go fishing all the time, we do breakfast all the time, I cook that same chicken fried rice every Thursday. The only new thing that was introduced to our life was that damn dog man. And for the record, we haven't been back to that lake fishing again. My auntie Rashiba is butch or lesbian. I'm not sure what you call them these days. But what I can tell you is she doesn't identify as a man. But she sure as hell is built like one. See, she grew up with five brothers. According to my dad, she's the toughest of them all. So when Auntie Rosheba showed up at our house at 8.45 p.m. seeking shelter, my whole family was confused. The woman looked worn down, bags under her eyes, and frankly, broken. That night, Dad kicks me out of my room and she heads upstairs to go to sleep, saying, I'll explain everything to you guys tomorrow. She came over on a Friday night, and the woman slept until Sunday morning. I mean, nothing we did would wake her up. And when she finally wakes up, we're headed out of the front door to go to church, and she's asking about coffee. Two hours later, we're back home from church. Mom has made brunch. We're sitting down at the table, and she goes on to explain that she has a story to tell. Now, the words that proceeded out of her mouth combined created the most terrifying story I have ever heard about the Rougarou. You see, she lived in Longville, Louisiana. 22 acres of land, her and her partner Katrina. My auntie goes on to say that Katrina had left the property two weeks ago because she was scared for her life. It all started one night the two of them were in bed watching TV when the power went out. Auntie Rosheba, being the prepper that she was, goes out the back door to their little shed and turns on the generator. Right then and there is when she hears Katrina screaming at the top of her lungs. Rushing back inside of the house to the bedroom, she finds her down on the floor, body curled into a ball in the corner of the room. The bedroom window open, and the screen slit with what clearly looks like three claw marks. And over the next 45 minutes, she tries her best to calm Katrina down. But nothing will work. Finally, an hour and a half later, Katrina explains that when the power went out, she decided to get up and open the window to let some fresh air in. And you know how it is when you walk to the window to open it. You don't necessarily look out of it. You just hit the latch and slide it open. But when she turned to look out of the window, she saw this snout and these teeth pressing against the screen. Eyes wide open, fully dilated, quickly adjusting to the darkness. She realizes there's two gigantic yellow eyes the size of the palm of her hand right there in the window. It scared her so much she reaches to close the window. This gigantic claw hit against the top.
top of the window and begin to slide all the way down. Scared for her life, Katrina dives on the floor and slides over to the corner. Mm -mm. My auntie painted a clear picture of the sheer terror that the woman was experiencing. Cold sweats, body shivering, eyes wide open, barely able to string together coherent sentences. Then, get this. She goes on to explain that two days later, she's on the roof fixing some shingles that had blown off in that storm that turned the power out. When she sees this huge wolf running along the outside of her fence around her neighbor's pond, it dives into the pond, gets wet, climbs back out of the water, shakes the water off its fur, and keeps running. Now, listen to me. I've been to Auntie Roshiba's house. I've seen that pond. It's about 85 yards away from their house. And understand, this is new for my entire family. We had never seen my auntie afraid. As she's sitting here talking to you, she looks like she's lost it all. It was huge. I've never seen an animal that big in my life, she exclaims. Jet black, running on all fours, it was fast. She pauses, telling her story dropping her head into our hands, leaving us all in suspense. And as we sit there waiting for the next words to roll out of her mouth, her cell phone rings. It's her partner, Katrina. And you can hear her words echoing from the telephone. Did you get out of there? Are you okay? Are you okay? Did you get out of there? I was so worried about you. You should have left a long time ago. The two of them go back and forth for a few seconds, then get off the phone. It takes my auntie a while to catch a train of thought. And then she says, oh, oh yeah, the pond, the pond. Listen, it climbs out of the pond, takes off running. And up until that point, I figured that Katrina had lost her mind. But I saw this thing. She goes on to explain to us that that night after seeing that animal, she couldn't sleep. Nor could she believe that it was even real only way she was able to make an adjustment and get some peace of mind was just to come to terms with it. There's a very, very big wolf out here and I need to keep a weapon on me everywhere I go. So that's what she did. Over the next four days, she came and went as normal, carrying her weapon on her. And she said things seemed to calm down a bit. That's until that following Friday night. Roshiba and Katrina are coming home from a party. They pull up in the driveway and notice a black mass on the side of the house. According to her, it looked like a tall man wearing a black hoodie. So she gets out of the car, weapon in hand, intending to confront him. But by the time she gets to the front bumper of the car, she hears this growl. Bones shaking, her intestines vibrating adrenaline pumping, fear rushing, the two of them run as fast as they can into the house, closing the door behind them. And for the rest of that night, they hear scratching on the roof, beating on the walls, so afraid that they sleep in the living room with all the lights on. Just before sunrise, things seem to have calmed down. Katrina has fallen asleep, and my auntie Roshiba is in the kitchen making some coffee. She gets a cup from the cabinet, closes it behind her, turns her back on that same cabinet to pour coffee, and when she turns around again, all the cabinet doors are wide open. Now let me pause here for a moment in the story and explain something to you. The look on this woman's face when she said this was beyond fear. It was beyond fright. It was something I had never seen before. It was almost as if Sitting there, she was having an out-of-body experience trying to explain to us the things that had been happening at her house. Both hands gripping and squeezing that coffee cup, her body squirming in the chair as she tries to get comfortable. She says that's when things really, really got bad. It was hard for us to tell had we gone crazy or if we were actually having something going on in the house. The two of them mentally and emotionally exhausted 
try their best to get some rest to go back to work for Monday, but strange things just kept on happening. The TV would turn on by itself. Water would just appear in the bathroom, sometimes in a sink, other times in a bathtub, and other times on the floor. She takes a sip of her coffee, sits back in a chair and says, like I said before, at first I thought one of us had gone crazy. So she goes outside, turns the water supply off to the house at the main faucet. And the puddles of water still were showing up in the sink and on the floor. The two of them were being haunted by day and terrorized by night. And by Monday evening, Katrina couldn't take it anymore. She decided to leave. And she begged my Aunt T. Rosheba to leave with her. Sitting there, tears rolled down her face as she said, you know, I really, really should have left with her. But it's our home. And we're supposed to protect our home. Wiping the tears from her face, she explains to us, by Monday night, she's all alone and the activity starts again. Kitchen drawers opening, cabinet doors opening, bedroom doors opening and closing on their own, water appearing in the sink, on the floor in the hallway. My auntie said the only thing that could come to mind was something that she'd seen on one of the paranormal TV shows, which was that this type of activity fed off of fear. So she decided to ignore it. This woman had developed her own little saying to allow her to mentally adjust to it. Every time she saw something strange or weird, she would just say, fuck you, this is my house. Listen, that following evening, she leaves the house, goes to the grocery store, comes back with some chicken, fires up the grill, grills that chicken, sits outside playing music and drinking a beer. The entire time she was outside, she could hear things moving around in her house. Glasses and dishes moving in the sink. Forks and knives jingling in the drawers. But she had decided she wasn't going to let any of that scare her. So, she sat there, eating her chicken, drinking her beer, and reading a book. She looks at my dad and says, I guess ignoring it was a bad decision. Because eventually she got thirsty, went inside to get a bottle of water from the refrigerator, and when she tries to go back outside through the back door, the door would not open. She went to the front door of the house, and the door would not open. She walked from room to room to room to room, trying windows, and nothing in the house would open up to let her out. My Auntie Rosheba explained to us that as she pulled on those doors and tried to open the window, she had this feeling of panic and fear come over her, but she recognized it. So she just laid down on the bed and waited 30 minutes, then got up and walked out the back door. Now get this, she says right at about 5.30, she had finished eating, drunk her beer, and began to feel sluggish and tired, like she was having a sugar crash, but she hadn't eaten any sugar. So she heads inside, locks the front and the back door, sits down at the table, and the next thing you know, she's passed out. And when she wakes up, it's 10 p.m. All the doors and windows to the house are open. The front door is wide open. The back door is wide open. And that's when Rosheba realized she couldn't ignore what was going on. It was too much for her to deal with. So she left right then and there, frantically going to one of her neighbor's houses, telling the neighbor everything that happened. And the neighbor explains to her that there's something in the woods around here called the bear wolf. He explains to her that this particular bear wolf must have strayed away from the big woods near Vinton, Louisiana, and came over into their area. Then goes on to tell my auntie Rosheba about the time he had an encounter with the bear wolf himself and experienced the exact same paranormal activity. To, now to make a long story short, my dad, my auntie Rosheba, and two of my other uncles headed back over to that house to see exactly what was going on. Now, I can't tell you everything that happened while my dad was at that house, but I can tell you this. 
He was gone for one night, and the two of them came back at 6 o'clock in the morning. They never explained to me everything that happened, but I know one thing. I, but I know one thing. By 8 o'clock that morning, they were on the phone arranging for a U-Haul truck and movers to get her stuff out of that house. My Auntie Rosheba now lives in Houston, Texas. Now listen to me. I've asked my auntie, I've asked my dad, I've asked my uncles to explain to me and tell me what happened when they went back to that house. But whatever the hell happened was so scary that none of them, I mean none of them, want to talk about it. It all started when Old Face Larry, my friend, came running down the road saying, Man, I don't know what the hell I just seen, but whatever it was, man, that shit not right. Listen, we call him Old Face Larry because he looks like an old man, even though he's aged 18. Larry played basketball, so he would go out on these long five-mile runs on the back roads between Lumberton, Mississippi and Poplarville, Mississippi. Well, he had just finished one of those runs, and honestly, I've never seen Larry breathing this hard. That's when he says, man, there was something out there running in the woods while I was running on the road, and it looked like a fucking werewolf. We laughed, thinking he done lost his damn mind, right? But Larry insists that he's not joking, so I foolishly suggest that we take the pickup truck and head back up there. Understand, my oldest brother Ross had this beat up red pickup truck. So we all pile up in that pickup truck and head back up the road to the location. Now, when we get to the spot, you can see a towel, a bottle of water, and keys. And that's when Larry starts screaming, saying, Yeah, right there. Right there is where I saw it. Scared me so much, I dropped everything and just took off running. So we all climb out of the truck, get his stuff. And we're just standing there, staying close to the truck, but looking around. And I get this, I'm scanning the trees and the bushes, but I'm looking low to the ground. When I turn and look in Larry's direction, he has this look of fear on his face, man. And yes, Larry is staring straight into the woods. So my eyes trace his eyes, and I realize that he's looking up at the branches of the tree. We're talking about 10 to 13 feet in the air. And it was hard to see at first, but when you took a close look, you could see these huge yellow eyes staring back at us. And by huge, I mean big as the bottom of that water bottle. Those yellow eyeballs darting back and forth, looking at each and every one of us. That's when Larry says, do you see it? Do you see it? Now, listen to me as much as I wanted to think that Larry had lost his mind? Nope, not at all. I saw those giant yellow eyes. So we all piled in the truck and get the hell out of there. Larry is sitting there in a cold sweat. And that's when he reveals to us that he saw a second one on the opposite side of the road while he was climbing back into the truck. Now, imagine the scene. There's three of us sitting in my brother's red truck parked in a driveway when Ross comes out of the front door 
And I guess he could tell that something was wrong. Because he says, what the hell is wrong with you boys? And when we tried to explain to my older brother what we experienced, he just starts laughing at us. <laughs> Boy, y'all stupid. I can't believe y'all went down there. You know what you saw. You know what you saw, right? We're like, no, what was it? He says, that's the Wolfmen. They've been around here since before these towns was built. Your stupid ass is lucky it didn't eat you. Give me my keys and get the hell out of my truck before you get it messed up. Now, as we're climbing out of Ross's truck and I'm handing him the keys, he, he says, listen, y'all might as well go ahead on and take off all those clothes, including your underwear, put them in a brown paper bag, take them out back, and burn them. That way them wolfmen don't come over here to our house. We don't need that kind of shit over here at our house. Go ahead on and burn it right now. And guess what? Within the next 30 minutes, we had changed clothes and burnt everything that we had on, including my Nike tennis shoes. Now, let me explain something to you. I got to give Old Face Larry all the credit in the world. He's a brave, brave man. Because me, I never went anywhere near that area again. But you see, Larry had ambitions of being a college basketball player. And this crazy fool went running down that same road the following week. When I asked him if he had seen anything crazy or strange or felt anything weird, Larry said no. He prayed about it, and he took off running. Looking back on it all, Larry's efforts paid off because he got a full basketball scholarship to the University of Arizona. As for me, I ended up working at a chicken plant. <laughs>